Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. I hope you've had a good weekend and a restful weekend. Thank you for making this Bible class a part of your Sunday morning or your Sunday afternoon. I hope that you've been reading along with us as we're studying through the book of Hebrews, uh, the complete work of Christ and what He has done for us and how we are to persevere in our faith is kind of the overall theme of this letter and of this sermon from the Apostle Paul. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 3 this morning for this lesson. So if you have your Bible, if you have notepad, if you have it on your phone or your tablet, please go ahead and pull that up. We'll look at uh, Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to save time uh, by not reading the Scripture, so you know this is a habit of mine. I hope that you will make time to read the Scripture, that you'll make time to read the chapters that we are in. Uh, to take your own personal notes and add to what we are discussing here in our classes. So if you'll remember uh, that one of the things that we've seen since chapter 1 is how Jesus is greater. In chapters 1 and 2, Jesus is greater than the prophets. He is greater than any of the God's spokespersons uh, who have come before him. Uh, he is greater than angels. Uh, the message that Jesus brings and provides is greater than the message provided by angels uh, that was given to Moses. Uh, he is greater because of his cosmic salvation, his, his work on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, cements the claims of Jesus as the Son of God. So that's kind of where everything was in chapter 2. And so now in chapter 3, we're going to make a, a kind of a small shift, but still under this heading that Jesus is greater. So remember, the, the audience of the Hebrew preacher is that they're, they're really sitting on a fence. So some of the Christians that he is well aware of, whether this is the church in Jerusalem or the church in Rome, some of the Jewish Christians have already left. They have left the faith. They have quit uh, persevering in the faith, being faithful, being obedient, uh, they've just turned their back and gone back into Judaism, gone back into uh, the ways of the world. There are those on the other side who are still maintaining that faith and doing all that they can uh, to remain faithful and consistent and hold fast to the confession. And then there's this group, and this is the main audience of the Hebrew preacher, is that this group that's sitting on the fence, they can't decide. Do we follow brothers and sisters, maybe family members, close friends who have quit? Do we just abandon the faith? Or do we double down? Do we go back and persevere in the faith and hold on? No matter how much our physical numbers may be shrinking, we're going to remain faithful. We're going to continue to choose God. So that's kind of the audience and the makeup of this in chapter 3. And chapter 4 are really going to speak to this. So we're, again, we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, on reading the scripture. We're just going to kind of put it into segments. So chapter 3 and verses 1 through 6 is this, this short but very powerful uh, uh, place of scripture that shows and proves that Jesus is better than or greater than Moses. So he's, Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than the angels, and now Jesus is better than Moses. And this would perk up the ears, especially of Jewish Christians, those who have that Jewish ancestry and a Jewish background. No one's greater than Moses. If anyone is greater than Moses from an Old Testament perspective, it would be Abraham. Everything started with him. But after Moses, everyone is co pales in comparison to him, no matter how great they were. Until you get to Jesus, and the Hebrew writer is going to go out of his way to show how Jesus is greater or better than Moses. So I, I put these in columns so that if you wanted to write down, you can kind of see. So Moses is called and, and is considered and regarded <coughs> excuse me, as faithful to God. That's the one thing that Moses shares with Jesus. Both Jesus and Moses were faithful to God in what God called them to do. Moses was called to go to Egypt. Uh, delivered the nation of Israel out of Egyptian slavery, led them through the wilderness and up through the promised land. Moses was faithful to the law that God gave to him through the hands of Moses. Jesus was faithful. He delivers humanity, if humanity so chooses, uh, from slavery to sin. Jesus' work on the cross, his resurrection, his ascension to, to heaven, the message that he provides, all of this 
exhibits and, and exemplifies the faithfulness of Christ. Moses the same way. But that's where the commonalities end. They begin and end with that. Moses is faithful, but the Hebrew writer is, is, puts a point of emphasis that he is faithful as a servant. You've heard me say this before, but just as a reminder, the highest regard, if we wanted to put a label on it, the highest regard that someone in the Old Testament could have when it came to their relationship with God or their walk with God is that they would be regarded as servants. Moses is the servant. Uh, Joshua is a servant. Uh, Enoch is a servant. So, so many others that come after them, prior to them, they are regarded as servants. So Moses is faithful, but his faithfulness is from a position of servitude. He is a servant to Yahweh. Jesus is faithful as well, but he is not faithful as a servant. He is faithful as the son. He is, his position, his prestige as the son of God, and his faithfulness is exemplified and it's emphasized over Moses because Jesus is the Son of God, whereas Moses is only the servant of God. And as a servant, you see this on the last bullet point on my, on my left-hand side, where Moses is a servant in God's house. So if you were going from an Old Testament perspective, the nation of Israel is considered to be God's house. It, not just the temple or the tabernacle that would have been under Moses' time, the tabernacle. But Moses is also a servant in God's house that is the nation of Israel. He, is, he just moves among the people. Is he a leader? Yes. Is he regarded as a prophet? Yes. But the highest regard that he could have is that he is a servant in God's house. He is still one of God's people. Jesus, by virtue of being the son, not only is his faithfulness exhibited from the position of being a son, but by being the son, he is over God's house, and that is a huge, huge difference from Moses. Moses is in God's house. Jesus is over God's house. And of course, God's home, God's house today from under the perspective of the New Testament is the church. Those who have been called out, those who are part of the kingdom, uh, though, with the church being founded and established, uh, promised in Matthew 16, founded and established in Acts 2, Jesus is the head. He is over God's house. So while he is among his people, uh, while Jesus walks among us, considers us to be brothers and sisters of his in terms of faith, he is still over us. So the Son is Lord. The, the Son is King. And these are the differences. So Jesus is greater than Moses because his faithfulness stems from being the Son of God. And then his faithfulness is exhibited as being the Son over God's house. So just kind of a quick thing that the Hebrew writer is going to set. And now he shifts uh, to the topics that are at hand that really deal with uh, Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4. So kind of a, uh, an outline, kind of an underlying question. So faithfulness of Moses and Jesus have already been established. And there's a point that the Hebrew preacher wants to make. The faithfulness of the leader, the faithfulness of the leader, whoever the leader is. So in this case, we'd look at Moses we look at Jesus. The faithfulness of the leader does not guarantee the faithfulness of the people who follow. Just because someone is faithful here doesn't mean the, per the people that are associated with that person are faithful too. No, each person must make their decision to be faithful. And what the Hebrew writer is going to say in the rest of chapter 3 and all of chapter 4 to emphasize this point is that while Moses was faithful... Israel was not. Israel, as a nation, failed in the wilderness multiple times. It wasn't just when they denied what, what uh, the spies brought back in terms of evidence from the promised land. But actually what we'll see is that the moment Israel enters into the wilderness outside of... So she crosses the Red Sea and she enters into the wilderness and makes this trip to Sinai... From that moment and crossing the Red Sea, Israel's failures in the wilderness start, uh, start to arrive. No matter how faithful Moses is, and by the way, Moses has his own moments of failures, of falling short. So does Aaron. Israel failed in the wilderness under the leadership of Moses. The underlying question 
of chapters 3 and 4 of the Hebrew letter is will the church fail? Our leader, Christ, the author and the pioneer of our faith, the savior of our soul, the head of the church, he is faithful in everything that God has put him in charge of. He is faithful in the mission, the message of God. Jesus' faithfulness has been established in every moment. He's greater than Moses because when Jesus is put in the position and tempted to fail, he does not. Jesus remains obedient, even obedience to the death on the cross. So all of that's coming in. The question is, will we as the church, will we stay faithful to? If our leader is faithful, will we stay faithful? Will we match up to him? Will we follow him? Will we bring ourselves under his rule, under his authority? Remember Hebrews 2, the last lesson Everything has put, been put into subjection to Jesus. The church is under. It submits to Jesus. But that doesn't mean that we won't fail. Will the church stay faithful in her periods of wilderness wandering? The people that are on the fence, the Hebrew writer, the Hebrew preacher is really emphasizing this. If you are considering abandoning the faith, you need to know that you will follow the same path that Israel followed in the wilderness. And that is what he's going to speak to. The other thing about Hebrews 3 is that he quotes from Psalm 95. So just a quick outline of Psalm 95, because that is an, uh, a big piece of chapters 3 and 4 for the Hebrew preacher. Remember, any time that we see an Old Testament quotation in the New Testament... Find your nearest stopping point and go back and read that and get a good idea of the context of, of whatever that Old Testament quotation is. So Psalm 95, in the first seven and a half verses, there's a call of the psalmist, an invitation for the nation of Israel to come and worship Yahweh. Give him honor, give him praise, give him glory, uh, give him what is due. The same applies for us that we are to call. We are, we are called and invited to worship Yahweh in the first day of the week. We'll see that a little bit later down in, in Hebrews 10. But we, as the church, are to follow in the same footsteps as the nation of Israel. Our Savior, our Creator, our Sustainer is worthy of our worship, and we are to give that to Him. Now, starting about halfway in verse 7 to verse 11, there, the call shifts from an invitation to worship to an invitation and a call to hear Yahweh. Hear what he has to say. So it's not just in terms of worship, but the responsibility of God's people to Yahweh, to God, is to worship him, but then also to hear him. And that's the emphasis in, seven, in, in Psalm 95, halfway through verse 7, all the way to verse 11. That is the call. And so the two themes of Psalm 95 are found in those two bullet points at the end of the slide. Listen today. And listen to obey. Listen today and listen to obey. So we'll, we'll really crack these open and look at what they mean. But if I can go ahead and say something now. The best time to listen to God is right now. The best time to listen to God is not when you get your life together. Not when you get your job out of the way. Not when the kids grow up and go to college. Not when any of that happens. Because none of that's really going to happen. Just because one thing gets done doesn't mean another comes in and, and fills that void. The best time for any of us, whether individually or us as the church, to listen to God is right now. It's today. Yesterday's gone and all of the opportunities with it. Tomorrow is not here, nor is it guaranteed. The best time to listen to God is right now. But we don't listen to God just to listen. We listen to God. We listen to his word. We listen to everything that he says so that our lives, our lives, can, that this knowledge, this information, these truths will translate and transform into a life of obedience. That's really where we're at. Israel failed at both. They did not listen to God when they had the opportunity. And because of that, they fail to obey. And we're going to see how that ties in. I cannot stress that enough for all of us, that the best time to listen to God is now. It is today. 
but the purpose of our listening is so that our lives can be lived out of love for Him and to Him and worship to Him, that we listen for the purpose of obedience. So what the Hebrew preacher will do is that he will quote most often from Psalm 95, verse 7 through 11. And if you look at that section in Psalm 95, it has as its foundation two events, Exodus 17 and Numbers 14. And the theme of all of that is unbelief, how Israel did not believe. She did not believe God. Now, there are two aspects of unbelief in the New Testament. One is unbelief in the, in the sense, and you could say this for the, for the entire Bible, I refuse that God, to believe that God exists. There is no God. There is no Jesus. There is no spirit. I, I just, what we have coined in terms of atheism. That's one layer of unbelief. Another aspect of unbelief is that I do believe in God. I do believe in Jesus. I believe in the Word of God. What I don't believe, what I don't do, is that that belief does not lead me to trust God. And it does not lead me to believe His promises. So the unbelief of Israel in the wilderness is not that they don't believe in God. They do is that they refuse to trust God in the wilderness. And they refuse to believe the promises of God in the wilderness. For those on the fence, this should grab their ears. Their struggle, the reason why they're on the fence to begin with, the reason why so many have left the faith and abandoned it, and have literally turned their back on it, is that somewhere along the way in the path, they stopped trusting in God, not just believing, but they stopped trusting in God and believing and trusting in God's promises. And so the, the logical position, the natural result of that unbelief is that you're on the fence. You don't know whether you should continue in the faith or abandon the faith. We have to be careful of the same thing because it can happen to us. And this is one of the things that we struggle with, that well, we can, we can, you know, once I believe, I'm, I'm always going to be okay. Hebrews 3, Hebrews 4, prove to us that it is possible and that it happens on more than one occasion that a believer, a person who believes in God and believes God can move away from him to the place and the position of unbelief. And it starts when they stop trusting God and believing His promises. One of the evaluations of our faith that needs to be constantly brought out for among us uh, and individually and then as a church is how much are we trusting God? Are we listening to God to build that trust? And are we living, and again, obedience? Why do I obey God? Well, I obey God for a variety of reasons, but among those is because I trust in what He says. It very well could be that a lack of obedience is, is an outward lack of obedience is just a reflection of an inward lack of trust, specifically within his promises. Evaluate your faith and how much you trust God. We need to do the same. So in verses 7 through 19, what the Hebrew writer is going to do is kind of show us the process of a hardening, unbelieving heart, a hardening heart. The hardening, hardening of the heart that leads to unbelief. So there are four things that he's going to mention in verses 7 through 19. One, don't hear God. The, the surest way to develop and to create a hard, unbelieving heart is to stop listening to God. I've only been a minister for a short amount of time in regards to so many other people who hold this position, only about 17 years or so. But for those who recognize that their lives have been moving away from God and they come in and they, they need help and I'm glad they're asking for help, inevitably, inevitably, in those conversations, it comes out that one of the reasons why they are where they are is because so many days or weeks or months ago, they stopped hearing God. They stopped listening. And I'm not talking or advocating that we hear God audibly. He doesn't do it that way. It's that we stop listening to this. If this word of God is not 
part of our daily life, and if it's, if it's not intentionally embedded into our heart daily, we're going to hear God less and less and less. And when we hear God less and less and less, we're going to struggle to trust Him. And when we str- struggle to trust Him, we're going to struggle to continue to believe in Him. And it's a vicious, vicious pattern and path. If you want a sure way to harden a heart and get it to the place of unbelief, just stop listening. The other thing is, is just waste today. I don't have to do anything spiritually today. I can can focus on something else. I can make something else a priority. I can make someone else a priority. But this emphasis of Psalm 95 and verses 7 through 11 that the Hebrew preacher brings up is, listen to God and listen today. Well, I can waste today. Because right now, again, today is all that God has given me. Right here in this moment, this is all that he's given. And I can do something productive. From a spiritual perspective, I can do something productive and beneficial and helpful. Or I can just waste it. And spend that time and spend that effort on something else. So the process, hardening a heart to a point where it's an unbelief, don't listen, stop hearing God, waste today in the spiritual opportunities it holds, and repeat two events. Repeat the event of Mirabah and repeat the event of Massah. Now these two events were found in Exodus 13 and then in Numbers 33, they're recounted in there. Meribah is where Israel is in the wilderness, and it's right after. This is Exodus 17. They're right after. They're fresh on the heels of God, dividing the Red Sea. They crossed over. Everything is great. And then they start complaining. Well, where's the water? Where's the food? It was better back in Egypt. And the text says that the nation of Israel quarreled with Moses. In other words, it wasn't just the fact that their unbelief was something happening in their heart, but it actually led them to quarrel, to argue with God's established leader, that is Moses. Now, we may be wondering, well, I'm not quarreling with our elders, I'm not quarreling with them, and that's a great thing. But we can repeat Meribah by complaining about all the things that God isn't doing. God brought us out into the wilderness only to die of thirst. God brought us out into the wilderness only to die of hunger. God did this only for this to happen. And these are complaints, but they are quarreling because they didn't trust God. And it's, it's, I know for all of us, it's amazing to consider this powerful, literal miracle of God dividing the Red Sea and Israel crossing over on dry, dry ground only for a few short days later to not trust that God could provide for their physical needs in the wilderness. They quarrel because they don't trust. They don't trust God. They don't trust Moses. They don't trust Aaron. They don't trust any of them. One of the sure ways of a hard heart, of an unbelieving heart, is when we don't trust. And a lack of trust leads to quarreling among God's people and a quarreling with the leaders. Massah is the same thing. It's kind of the same events. But this time, God and Moses both consider it a test. When we don't trust God, we end up testing God. And every person, and here's a reminder, we think, well, that's, that doesn't happen to us. We put God to the test when we don't unbelieve. Uh, when we unbelieve, we put God to the test when we don't trust There's only one time in the entire Bible where God gives permission to put him to the test. Every other example, both testaments, every other example of a person or particular group or nation, or in this case, the church that puts God to the test, never ends well. Our unbelief, should we be on the fence and we consider, you know what, I I can't trust God, I'm just going to start abandoning. When we abandon, or in that process of hardening our heart and unbelief and abandoning the faith, we are putting God to the test. And in a few short chapters, the Hebrew writer will pull out some of the most dire warnings that once we do that, 
we are removing ourselves from under the goodness and the righteousness and the protection of the blood of Jesus. One of the worst things that happens as a result of an unbelieving hard heart is that we do put our soul in jeopardy. And we need to hear that. I know that's not a positive thing. I know that's not something that makes us feel good. I know that's something that you know, we want God to be for us and with us. We've got to be faithful. But if we stop listening to God, if we waste the spiritual opportunities of today, if we stop trusting in Him or get to the point where we have a lack of trust more than trust, if we put God to the test, these are surefire ways of not just having a, an unbelieving hard heart, but a surefire guaranteed way of abandoning the faith at some point in time. The Hebrew writer is warning those who are listening to them, if he will listen to him. This is what Israel did. And it's, it can happen to the church as a whole, and it can happen to disciples of Christ. Verses 15 through 19, he continues with the negative practical implications. And this was one of those that I actually had to stop because I didn't consider this from, from this perspective. So I had to underline it and actually write it in my notes. But this unbelief, this hard heart that is full of unbelief, the Hebrew preacher, and he's just standing on the shoulders of what Moses calls it and what God calls it in the Old Testament, this unbelief is actually rebellion. It's actually considered rebellion. So the sin that, takes, that happens, or the sins, if you want to talk about it in terms of multiplicity, is that they stop listening, but it leads them not just to a place of unbelief where we kind of think, oh, that's stagnant. I, I neither believe nor unbelieve. No, what, what he considered it, when God's people hear what God has to say, and they are saved, but then they walk this path of a lack of trust and a lack of unbelief, and it's more, it's realized and quarreling. The Hebrew writer, the Hebrew preacher says, that's actually rebellion. Israel rebelled in the wilderness. They heard God's word through Moses in Egypt. Remember, God, God's word through Moses was, let my people go. God delivered his people through Moses. They heard the word of Moses at the Red Sea. Just be still. Watch. God is going to do something amazing. I'm paraphrasing. And he did. And they crossed through the Red Sea. And he, in 1 Corinthians 10 says that that Red Sea moment served as a type of baptism for them. So Israel heard the good news of God. And when they acted, when their faith acted on that good news, they were saved. But Israel gets over into the other side of Egypt, into the wilderness. And starting with Meribah, starting with Massah, they sinned in their unbelief, in their lack of trust. They sinned in their rebellion. And here's what happens, and this is a big difference that the Hebrew writer is going to say. Because a lot of us worry about our sin. Why well, am I in? Am I out? Am I a sinner today? Well, I did this. Israel kept on in their disobedience. It's one thing for all of us to fall short, and it's going to happen. But there is a difference when there, that happens, and then when a person does it and keeps on doing that. Israel went through the wilderness, and their rebellion wasn't just one time. It was multiple times. They kept on in their disobedience. And that's when disobedience and sin is categorized as rebellion. For those of you who are on the fence, you can almost hear the Hebrew preacher saying this, for those of you that are on the fence, if you keep on doing what you're doing, if you keep on walking the path you're on, you need to know, one, that the path is considered rebellion, and two, it's not going to end well. We know what happened to the generation of Israel that walked the wilderness, received the law, were saved the Red Sea, rebelled and sinned in the wilderness, made it to Sinai, received the law, and refused the promised land. We know what happened to them. All but two 
were lost in the wilderness. That is a warning that should perk up both of our ears and permeate our hearts. If we continue on in a lack of unbelief, a lack of trust in God and in His promises, it is called rebellion and it takes us away from the promises that are found in Christ. And once we are outside of Christ, there are no other avenues of salvation. There are no other avenues of forgiveness. There are no other ways to heaven. So if Israel lost all of those things, one generation of Israel lost all of those things in the wilderness, how much more will the church lose if she rebels, if she doesn't trust, if she doesn't believe the promises? Will the church fail? On one hand, no, the church will always exist because Jesus promised it. It doesn't mean that each individual church is going to be guaranteed in their salvation. It doesn't mean that every member of the church is guaranteed in their salvation. We need to pay attention. So, how, what do we do then? There are three things that the evil writer will say, and this will close our lesson for this morning. So what do we do? We go back to verses 12, 13, and 14. Here are the positives. So if you had two things of negative, here's our positive. First and foremost, take care. Some of you have a version that says, be aware. Beware of that heart. Beware of what's happening. Let's actually take a moment and read that just to see what he would have to say. So Hebrews 3, we're going to look at verse 12, 13, and 14. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold to our original confidence firm to the end. Take care. Take care of this heart. You want to go back to see what that looks like? This is almost a parallel with our study through Deuteronomy late last year. We need to be taking care of our heart. We need to be aware that this is, this is a very real possibility that can happen to any of us. Not just some of us, but any of us. That's the Hebrew writer's point. Take care lest there be in any of you. I need to take inventory of my heart and I need to see, am I trusting God the way that I say? Am I living out that trust? Am I listening? Am I obeying? Am I following? Am I trusting? All of these things take care, lest that happens. An evil, unbelieving heart. And notice what he says, that evil, unbelieving heart leads us away from the living God. 13, verse 13, encourage one another every day. Notice the emphasis. So not only are we to use today to listen to God, but then exhort, verse 13, exhort one another every day as long as it's called today. What, do I, what, what is it that we call this day? We call it today. There is an obligation. There is an opportunity. There is a responsibility to our brothers and our sisters in Christ. To encourage one another every day. So what we'll see is that, that the first day of the week, yes, is to be for a purpose of encouragement. But today is a purpose of encouragement too. For another brother or sister. For another individual, a disciple who is struggling. There is, one, there is that time where we need to be encouraged. But we can't just take all the encouragement and never give any out. We need to encourage each other. We need to literally put courage into someone who is lacking that. Opportunity of great spiritual opportunity today is to encourage. Maybe that's one of the things that needs to be done today is that when this lesson is over, when you participate with us within, within the first day of the week with worship, you find an opportunity through email, text message, call, whatever it is, to encourage another brother or sister in Christ. Do it on Monday, should the Lord give it. Do it on Tuesday, so forth and so on. The other is verse 14. We, we share in Christ. We have fellowship in Christ. We share in Him. All of these are brought under the umbrella of the end of verse 14. If indeed we hold our original confidence. 
take care, encourage, we share. If we hold. That if depends on me and you. You and I and the decisions we make will determine whether we hold or let go of what we have in Christ. Individually and then also as the church. Let's listen to the Hebrew writer today. Let's take into our heart the encouragement that he gives to take care of our heart, to encourage one another, to share in Christ so that none of us, none of us are lost in the wilderness that we call this life. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I hope it's been a benefit to you. Uh, I hope that you've been able to take some notes. As always, if you have any questions or comments or you want to talk about anything that's been said, in this lesson or in previous lessons, please reach out, let me know. Be more than happy to have those discussions with you. Please share this with a friend or a family member. Ask others and invite others to share in this Bible study. And know that it will be a benefit to them as well. As always, I hope that you have a great day and thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.